The 23rd of December 2020 was the day that I released my first ever video essay, Perspective and Empathy in Attack on Titan. Produced shortly before the end of the manga's serialization and just after the airing of season 4. I would not recommend you watch that video. It is, shall we say, technically flawed. I think the idea of completely disregarding your own perspective, your own viewpoints, your own beliefs, and trying to understand a set that's completely different to your own is something that people can struggle with sometimes. I am a robot, do what I say. I mean, if you must, go on. But to summarize it, it was essentially an overview of how the series had shifted away from evil, inhumane, easy monsters to nuanced, grey characters that blurred the line between antagonist and protagonist. In light of the series, somewhat controversial ending, I stand by most of what I said in that video. AOT is about unothering the other, and how terms like villain and hero are simplistic terms that sweep over the complexities of the human condition. That to decry people as monsters and evil and to seek revenge against them for perceived wrongdoings is narrow-minded and selfish. A self-perpetuating cycle of disease that can only be cured through empathy, compassion, and a letting go of hate. What has definitely changed, however, is my view on Erin, as have a lot of other peoples, some of whom have taken it… less than well. The final chapter, Toward the Tree on that Hill, does a lot to retroactively change how one views Erin's character and his motivations throughout the series. And while I'm for the most part on board with it, I can understand how jarring it came across, especially at the time. I do have my issues and problems with the ending, but that's not really what this video is about. I'll probably save those thoughts for a big Attack on Titan retrospective project that I'm planning on doing at… some point. Not anytime soon, but eventually, so subscribe if you want to keep an eye out for that. For now, I really just want to focus on Eren and try to articulate my new perspective on him. In some ways, this video is more from me than anyone else. Attack on Titan is a series that means a lot to me. It has some of my favourite moments in manga, and its themes and characters have influenced me more than I'm comfortable admitting. So in a sense, this video is me trying to find closure, if that's the right word. To finally sit down and collect my thoughts on this series that means so much to me, in spite of the flaws it may have, and in doing so, move on from it. Emotionally, at least. With that being said, let's begin. I suppose it would be prudent to start with how many people initially saw Eren Yeager, especially his post-time skip character, who, if you were to compare to the Eren of Season 1, almost seems like a completely different person. Calm, strong, near sage in his words, yet also ruthless, cold, almost unfeeling. One moment empathising with his arch-rival and almost exonerating him of his mother's death, and the next slaughtering hundreds indiscriminately. All this in the name of defending his home, Paradis, from a world that would see them dead before anything else. It was about the start of the War for Paradis arc, around chapter 107 or so, that the general perception of Eren, at least amongst a very sizeable portion of the fanbase, solidified. And he became this Sigma male type badass who would kill people without a second thought and after a long day's grind come home to clap the cheeks of his royal mistress. It got to the point where an honest to god cult of personality spawned around him. Not the one in the story, no, people literally started calling themselves Jaegerists after his faction. The fact that, for the longest time, we were never shown his POV or inner thoughts only really helped this. Even after his motives became clear and he initiated the rumbling, if anything, it just made things spiral even further. The debate as to whether or not the rumbling was justified was a huge point of contention in the fandom, which… Okay, you know what? I'm starting to see why people think this series is fascist. 
Not that you couldn't want to see the rumbling come to fruition without holding some questionable views. You might think it's the ending that makes the most narrative and thematic sense. You couldn't see any other realistic way for the series to end. Or you might even just admire the potential audacity of ending your series with the protagonist literally wiping out humanity. If this was you, then I'm absolutely not lumping you in with this definite minority. But it was a very loud minority. Or maybe it was just where I was looking. The fact that I was using Reddit for discussions probably didn't help. To a lot of people, this is what Eren was. This cool, reserved Chad who did what needed to be done, no matter how much blood got on his hands. Unlike those soy boy cucks like Armin, Mikasa, Jean, Connie, Hanji, Mikasa, hashtag cringe Avengers. It's a similar trap that people fall into with regards to characters like Erwin and, to an extent, Flock and Levi. To be fair, I thought he was this surface level too. The only difference being that I thought the series was positioning him as a clear antagonist figure. That his qualities and motives, while understandable, weren't meant to be necessarily empathetic. However, I started to get this little inkling in the back of my mind towards the end of the series, more specifically with the chapters 130 and 131. These were the first chapters in a long time to feature Eren, and were by far the most revealing since… I'd say his first appearance post time skip. Rather than effortlessly wiping out mankind without so much as a blink, Eren is racked with guilt. He breaks down, weeping in front of a child he barely knows, begging for forgiveness, fears what his mother would think, regresses to a child in order to cope with the stress. Admitting that, at the heart of things, this isn't about Paradi or the Eldian race. It's about him. What was really beyond the walls was nothing like the world I dreamed of. It wasn't the world I saw in Armin's book. When I learned that humanity lived beyond the walls, I was so disappointed. Ever since that day, without pause, he kept moving forward. Quite a far cry from the stoic Sigma psychopath some saw him as, eh? However, it was chapter 139, the finale, that truly shattered this image, revealing Eren's plan to position the Alliance as world heroes by defeating him, his love for Mikasa, his manipulation of events going back to his mother's death, and his motives behind the rumbling, eventually falling into the ocean and, rather pathetically, weeping about how he doesn't want Mikasa to move on from him. Eren Jaeger, crying, complaining, and pitiful. Reminds you of someone, doesn't it? I remember when the chapter first leaked, there were these mad conspiracy theories running around about how Isayama was drawing fake leaks to... I don't know, fuck with people? That should tell you all you need to know about how well some people took the ending. Hell, it was so controversial that they tried to pass off some weird fanfiction people made as a legitimate alternative to the actual ending, which is just... So many levels of copium, I j- I j- <laughs> Okay, okay, no, 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 okay, no. no I I'm not gonna go on a fucking tangent about this. Moving on, moving, moving on. When I first read the chapter, it was... weird. There was a lot of stuff I liked, and a lot that could have been done better. I think if those final two chapters had been paced a little slower, then the end result would have been better, but... meh. I don't really like to waste my time with what-ifs. I finished the chapter and Attack on Titan as a whole with an alright feeling. It didn't quite live up to my expectations, whatever those were, but I was overall fairly satisfied. However, I knew I would definitely have a lot of thinking to do before my opinion was fully solid. Well, that was the intention, but it got a little uncomfortable being in the fan base after that moment, and I think that kind of turned me off thinking about the series. So I didn't really think about it, and moved on to other things. That was until the promotion for the final season part 2 ramped up, and got me thinking again. Eren, just who are you? I think if I can figure that out, I'll be one step closer to understanding the series as a whole. Apologies if things get a little scatterbrained from this point, I'll try and keep a logical flow as I record my musings.
I think when it comes to understanding Eren Yeager, there are two things that we need to establish. Firstly, Eren is a character of contradictions. How he acts, how he thinks, what he does, what he says, how he views other people, how other people view him, and how the narrative treats him. All these aspects of his character tell us different, contradictory things about him, and the fact that they do is central to his journey and his personality. And accepting this is critical when it comes to understanding him. If you've heard the term doublethink before, this absolutely applies here. Secondly, Eren does not truly develop as a character. Superficially, he does undergo quite a radical transformation, but on a fundamental level, the Eren Jaeger we see in Chapter 1 is the same Eren Jaeger we see in Chapter 139. This is also a very crucial part of understanding his character, arguably the most important, which is why I'll save it for later. For now, we're going to take a look at one of the more significant examples of doublethink in the series, Eren and his relationship to the concept of freedom. Eren's assertion that he is free is one that is foundational to his character. It is the meta-motive that hangs over all his short-term goals. Every action he takes is in the name of advancing towards that nebulous dream of his. His determination to reach the sea, for instance, has nothing to do with the actual sea, but instead what being able to see it represents. The simple ability to go wherever he wants. It is impossible to analyse his character without bringing this up. But, if Eren is so obsessed with the idea of freedom that he himself is an individual in control of his own thoughts, actions and destiny, then why does he act like he has no choice but to commit to the rumbling? Why does he cry and apologise to a boy he knows he's going to kill? Confessing his dark and shallow motives as if he's seeking judgement, making it as clear as daylight that he doesn't want to do this. So why does he? Because, for all his talk of being free, Eren is more of a slave than anyone else in the series. In the early days of Attack on Titan, Isayama would make note of Eren being a slave to the narrative, being constantly dragged from plot point to plot point against his will as things just happened around him. By the end of the story, it feels like things have been taken to a logical and literal extreme. Eren being revealed as the one who had his mother eaten by influencing Dinah Fritz through paths. From the day he swore to kill the Titans and reclaim his freedom, Eren's entire life has been predestined. By himself, granted, but that just drives home Eren's willingness to surrender to fate. Yes, for all his screams and shouts of freedom, Eren was a glad servant of destiny. Or at least, what he saw as destiny. Even after knowing his rage and trauma were manufactured by himself, he continues to let it drive him. As for why, well, I imagine this will be somewhat controversial, but I think it comes down to the motives behind the rumbling. I think Eren wanted a way to reconcile the immense guilt over the rumbling while also looking for an excuse to initiate it in the first place. Again, we come back to those two chapters, 130 and 139. Eren's admittance that he was disappointed that mankind lived outside the walls, not that they hated him, just that they exist, tells us that even if his mother hadn't died, even if the world wasn't trying to eradicate his people, he still would have wanted it all gone. The outside world he imagined was an empty, limitless space of wonders for him and his friends to explore, just like the book he and Armin used to read. And on some level, he wants to return the world to that childish dream, even by the most gruesome of means. And if all this is preordained, if there's no other option, if it's all for the greater good, well, he has no choice, does he? How could he possibly be responsible for his actions after that? I think maybe we were born this way. I'll just keep moving forward. <gasps> Till I killed my enemies. As I thought, my mind kept wandering back to the final few pages of chapter 130, where Eren, as he advances on Marley, remembers Carla's death, the chapter ending on the words, Ever since that day, without pause, he kept moving forward. From the moment I read that, it stuck out to me. It was a signal, I think. A signal that, despite appearances, 
Eren hadn't changed, that deep down, he was still a ten-year-old boy, a traumatized, angry child who is lashing out at the universe, a selfish brat who hates the world not because it hated him first, but because it had the audacity to not exist as he imagined it. An empty sandbox, built for him to explore and play in at his leisure. This is foreshadowed by Eren's Attack Titan predecessor and namesake Eren Kruger, who watched through a wardrobe door as his parents were killed by Marlian officials, going on to devote his life to resisting Marley from the inside. But in all the years he acted as a spy, all he managed to do was maim and kill innocent people often his own. By the time his term was up, he had accomplished nothing aside from continuing the cycle of violence. Kruger himself is aware of this, admitting that at the end of the day he's still a child peeking out from behind a door, advising Grisha to avoid his mistakes by finding love and human connection. Eren, however, doesn't take this advice. Though he does love Mikasa and his friends, he runs from those emotions and pushes them away, instead choosing to orchestrate behind their backs. His choice to stay an angry boy who pushes people away just ends up causing more harm. Despite showing awareness of his lack of development, he never really does anything to change it. Eventually, he even comes to see it as a good thing. It's how he's able to say the cruelest things to Mikasa and still want her to obsess over him after he's dead. In this respect, Eren is a perfect foil to Reiner, someone who is constantly being shaped and molded by the people and environment around him. It's his experiences with other people that make him such a dynamic character, and ultimately it's his attachment to the people he loves that keeps him alive. But if Reiner is who he is because of other people, then Eren is who he is in spite of other people. Despite Grisha, Kala, Mikasa, Zeke, Armin, Eren was always Eren. He never grew up, he never changed, all the way down to the clothes on his back. Ever since I've been born, I've been me. If people are going to steal my freedom, I'm going to steal theirs. I've always been that way. Eren Jaeger is not a power fantasy, he is a deconstruction of one. He is a traumatized man-child who, aware of the damage that his uncontrollable bursts of anger will cause, seeks to justify them by acting as a chained puppet master, forcing himself and his friends down a route that will both satisfy his childish longings and allow him to shirk responsibility for the outcome. He is a fundamentally sad, pitiful character that represents the dangers that come from unresolved trauma and an inability to grow up in a healthy way. There's more I could talk about, like Eren's interesting connections to solipsism or the other contradictions in his character, but I don't want this to turn into me just rambling from disconnected thought to disconnected thought, so let's bring things back to that oh-so-divisive ending. Yes, I still have my problems with it, mainly related to pacing and the occasional iffy framing, but now I think I can look at it and understand what Isayama was going for. I see Eren in a very different way than I did a year ago, and I think that's for the better. In fact, I think I appreciate his character even more. It makes him feel more human, more nuanced than the stony, angry badass some people see him as. If you are one of those people, then I hope watching this has helped you to see things in a different light, and if not, fuck you. What are you gonna do? The dislike button's gone, bitch! <laughs> Uh, no, 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 seriously, if everything I've been saying so far sounds like absolute bullshit, that's cool. Thank you for watching this long anyway. A lot of others might not have, and I appreciate you hearing me out. I don't intend to talk about AOT again for a while, as in not for a good couple of years. I think the next time I do it will probably be for an eventual retrospective on the whole thing, in which I plan to go over some details I touched on here. If you'd like to be aware of whenever that goes up, as well as for all the cool stuff that'll come out before then, then like, comment, share, and subscribe. If you'd like to support me further, you could donate to my Ko-fi, buy my music on Bandcamp, including the original stuff that was used in this video, or pledge to my Patreon, where you can get behind-the-scenes snippets, an early look at songs, credits and videos, and full-length director's commentaries on every video, including this one, which should be up in about a week. Once again, like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.